Good morning. My name is Raquel Roca. I am a member of EFIC. It is for me an honor, on behalf of our magazine and on behalf of the Foundation of the Spanish Red Cross, to be here with you today and welcome you to this event, to this seminar, a spectacular seminar, as you will see, which is called Conversations, because we will be talking, but we will not only be talking, we will also want to land many of the topics we will discuss. It's called humanitarian conversations towards a sustainable future, sustainable present and future. Over the last few years, we have listened to terms such as SDGs, Agenda 2030, transformation within climate change. How many times have you heard it? Many times. Well, not enough. Absolutely not enough, because we're still here, we're still experiencing and actually suffering the consequences of something which we have created ourselves, human beings, and this has to do with this drama of the climate change, amongst other reasons. But the relevant question today that we will be exploring has to do with these conversations, but from the humanitarian point of view, from a humanitarian angle. The question is, what are the consequences of climate change from the point of view of the human side? That is why we are here today with this amazing brand that is hosting us today. We're talking about drought, loss of biodiversity, forests which are shrinking, becoming smaller and smaller, extreme climate. And the relevant question is, how is this affecting our populations, our human beings? Well, there are massive migrations that we will be talking about, as well as a huge energy poverty, which we will be discussing as well. Therefore, we are going to have powerful conversations, but these conversations are very much action geared, because this is a fundamental part of the Red Cross, it's implementing actions in the field, on site, where needed, so that things happen. So we are going to talk about all these topics, but we need to be running away from the myth of Sisyphus. Do you remember Sisyphus? We studied the myth of Sisyphus at, at school. It was a character who had to carry a heavy rock to the top of a mountain, and when he would wake up the day after, where would the rock be? Well, at the bottom of the mountain again. So he was feeling that his actions were irrelevant. And that is what we are thinking, talking and talking and talking without achieving results. We need to escape, run away from the effort, the metaphor of a useless effort done by human beings. So I want to quote a major thinker, a major author who said this, talking about Sisyphus. He, and I want to share with you to inspire you for the day. Early quote. He said, he who despairs of the human conditions is a coward, but he who has hope for it is a fool. So, this is the quote. Thank you very much to all speakers, to those of you who are with us in person and on site at home. Please remember that we, both online and in person, we have a beautiful hashtag called Conversaciones Humanitarias, where you can share all the information. And having said that, welcome, because you are amazing fools to be here with us today. So, without any further ado, on, on behalf of the Foundation of Spanish Cross, I want to welcome on stage its Vice President, Therese Jama. So, welcome on stage, Therese. Good morning. Good morning to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Dear representatives from academia, civil society and private companies, Dear representatives of the organizations that are members of our Board of Trustees of the Red Cross Foundation, and I also see you here, so welcome. Dear friends of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, dear friends, dear volunteers who I can see in the room, and we thank you for being here with us today. And special greetings to people who are following us online. So thank you very much for being here today. It is a great honor for me to welcome you on behalf of the Spanish Red Cross Foundation. 
With our event, we start our series of humanitarian conversations, and we do it within the framework of the activities planned by the Spanish Red Cross during the semester of the Spanish Presidency of the Spanish uh, of the Council of the European Union. The Spanish Red Cross Foundation, whose action is based on the fundamental principles of the International Red Cross and the Red Crescent Movement, aims to promote humanitarian thinking in society so that it can contribute to changing mindsets and also to bring about transformations and always for the benefit of people. We want to open up spaces for knowledge and in-depth analysis of the different trends, focusing our reflection and analysis on how they affect people and communities, especially those who are more vulnerable or at risk of becoming vulnerable. This year, we are working on climate change. Over the recent decades, our planet is experiencing an increase in climate change-related disaster, so there is an urgent need to manage the reduction of the impacts of these extreme weather events, both on people and communities. This concern is one of the priorities of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and it is excluded in its, included in its strategy 2030 as one of the priority global challenges for this decade. Internationally, the latest report of the IPCC, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, contained an urgent call. It's a call for climate action to ensure a livable future for all. This report places particular emphasis on the losses and damages that have already happened and that will continue to happen in the future, which particularly harm the most vulnerable people and ecosystems. The report in the findings also shared a message of hope, a positive message. More ambitious action that is right now is possible and it can bring about the transformational change that is essential for us. We are still in time, and that is what we are going to discuss today. These results will be part of our debate and search for agreements and commitment from the 30th of November, when the COP28 starts, which will take place this year in Dubai. Here today, our meeting called Humanitarian Conversations towards a sustainable world. With our event, we also want to join in and contribute to promoting the necessary changes and commitment. And I would like to thank you all, everyone who has made it possible for us to be here today. To the organizations that form part of our board of trustees, we have them present here today, BBVA, Bank of Spain, Banco Santander, Foundation Iberdrola Spain, Foundation Vodafone Spain, Once and Emilio Butragueño Foundation. He is not present here, but he's clearly supporting our foundation. And I also want to thank the speakers who will share with us their vision. Thank you to the ethic team. They have facilitated this event. And I also want to thank the teams of Red Cross Environmental and Social Studies and Innovation Knowledge Areas. Thank you, teams. Thank you to the foundation team. Congratulations, Salmo, Susana, Pablo, Sara, and all your team who are present here today. And I also want to thank you all who have joined us from other sites. We want to invite you all to use this hashtag, humanitarian conversations. This converse, may these conversations be a significant step towards a more sustainable and humane world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Therese, for your kind words and your beautiful energy, which we can also feel it in the room. Thank you for sharing with us this great welcome. We're going to start with the first dialogue, with the first panel. The first point is going to be the challenges and opportunities of climate change. And to do that, we have to 
top speakers and together in the same space. So we are really enjoying that. So Jose Manuel and Cristina, please come and join me on stage and I will introduce you properly. They uh, have a great deal of seniority, so they have XXL bios. So let me uh, share this. Their Info. She's a politologist, a sociologist, doctor from the University of Zaragoza. She's an expert in governance and ecological transition. She's been working in the C3 literary of the OPM. She is now at the board of ECODES. She is an analyst for different media and an author of several books such as 15M, Political Movement to Democratize Society, and how to hack politics. Welcome, Cristina. I also Jose Manuel Moreno Rodriguez. He is professor of ecology and director uh, of the environmental sciences at the University of Madrid. He is a professor of ecology, as I said, at the University of Castilla-La Mancha. And uh, I'm going to mention his awards. He has a great, he's a bit embarrassed, but there is an award he received. It was the national award for his research on forest fires, which is something that in Spain we need, we need to look after forest fires. So, I mean, the, the, he has a Nobel Prize with other researchers, but you can Google him and you can find out more information. And I have an essential speaker in this panel, my colleague Salome Erce. So please do come and join us. I want to introduce her with the same emphasis. She's also working at Think Lab, but she's also a volunteer of the Red Cross. She's been working for a long time and she has a lot to say. So I leave you with them. They are all yours. Welcome. I'm very happy to be here today, as Raquel said. So from uh, ethic, and I'm also a Red Cross volunteer, so I have two hats today and I'm feeling at home. Uh, the title is Challenges and Opportunities of Climate Change. As we very well know, climate change has consequences and it affects the well-being of people. We know that the challenges are huge, but they also open a door for opportunities. The bad news is that global warming is advancing at a really rapid pace with dire consequences for uh, many areas of life. The good news is that humans are part of the problem, but we also are part of the solution. So let's take that message, actually. As Therese said, in the last uh, IPCC September assessment, they made an urgent call for climate change, saying that to contain climate change, substantial and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions will be required. So this is my first question. What is the first step we need to take to substantially and sustainably reduce emissions? What is the first step? Laws, regulations, public awareness, com commitment from companies? What, is, what steps have been made and what steps need to be taken in the future along these lines? Should I start? Okay, well, let me start by thanking Red Cross and Ethic for the invitation and congratulating organizers and people supporting the fact that we are here, especially Sara. I know that she's been working uh, hard to make sure that we discuss this topic because we need to say that this is the main challenge that humankind has today. So it is unconceivable that an entity such as the Red Cross would not follow this debate. So it's really important that the Red Cross is party to the debate and uh, participate in a phenomenon that is n anything but simple. Climate change needs depth, analysis, and careful understanding. Scientists often tell us that we are walking along uncharted pathways. We don't know how the planet will react. We know that the forecasts occur sooner than we thought and with greater severity than expected. But as, as scientists say, we are walking along uncharted pathways. When you look at the latest IPCC reports and you look at the different graphs on temperature evolution, 
as a response of what we do, we see that there is an abysmal room for improvement. And so we, there's many, there are many things we can do. And what is the most important thing? Where can we start? Uh, the easy answer is to say everything at the same time. But public awareness, the role of companies, the role of governments is important. So we need to do everything at the same time. But if we uh, have a deeper understanding and we look at what we are doing in Europe, we have a level of public awareness which is quite high. There, COVID-19 was a turning point, a tipping point for, any, for many people in becoming aware of to which extent our life depends on the biosphere. And if, if the biosphere is healthy, we will be healthy. If the biosphere is sick, we will be sick. So public awareness has improved over the years, and we have a sufficient level of awareness in to, number one, have climate change as a demand for our governments, even uh, requirements that we integrate when we decide who we are going to vote. So regardless of who we vote, we need to integrate into our decision environmental policies and climate change. And secondly, we have a, a sufficient awareness to understand when governments make take measures, what they mean and how we can generate contradictions in our life. And we have to understand what for and why we are taking them. In private companies, we see that there is an increase, an amazing increase of green economy. There is an amazing the investment uh, in non-green economies. So investment funds are prioritizing exclusively green economies. And it is also true that there's been an economic turn. Is it due to environmental reasons? Well, I'm not sure. Maybe it's only because of financial risks, but it is there. And regulation is making progress. We have more and more regulations, and we have better ways of complying with it. We have a huge challenge, which is the download speed. We need to do things faster and reach the whole population. And to do that, the three levers that we have just pushed, public awareness, public sphere, and private sphere, there's one which is especially relevant, which is public policies. So the short answer is the three at the same time. But if I have two priorities, one lever in specific, that would be public policies. What do you think, Jose Manuel? Well, thank you very much. And I also join the kind words of Cristina uh, as Cruz Roja and other institutions. Uh, and uh, I was talking to the church a few weeks ago. So, you know, everybody's realizing that climate change is important because you walk in the most difficult conditions. Uh, you work in disasters, in harsh, extreme situations. And uh, this being prepared is key, knowing that patterns will change, that intensity will change, that frequency will change. And things cannot catch us unprepared. A few years ago, when the Syrian crisis occurred, it was due to an exceptional drought, which was partly caused by climate change. And suddenly, Europe saw one million citizens fleeing from their country, and nobody had thought about it. Well, they hadn't thought about it because they don't read the IPCC thick and long reports, because they talk in depth about migration problems. What can people do if they don't have their basic needs covered? They go away. So I'm very happy to see that the Red Cross is approaching these issues because they are really part of your response. So how can we substantially and sustainably reduce emissions? Well, what Christina said is true, all of the, all of the above. But we need to reduce emissions. Emission reduction is critical. According to the International Energy Organization, 
reports, e producing countries say they don't plan to reduce, but actually they continue increasing producing fossil fuel production. So Houston, we have a problem. We need to reduce a lot, and now, and a lot means a lot. It means almost as much as we reduced during lockdown, during COVID. So that's a lot, a huge amount of reduction. During lockdown, the world economy was paralyzed, it was stagnated. So we need to reduce it year on year at the same level and at the same magnitude and successfully, or we hope that the mid-century we arrive to zero net emissions. But what science says we need to do, because IPCC does not prescribe policies, what we do is just we say, what do you want? We say, well, I, I don't want to get a temperature higher than this. Well, the IPCC says, if you don't want this, you can do this, but scientists don't rule decision makers are politicians. So there is a mismatch there between what science is saying that needs to be done to reach their commitments and what countries are actually doing, people who sell this black liquid <laughs> do, right? So we need to insist on these countries. And these citizens in these uh, countries, they want to have a really great life, especially their rulers want to have a great life. But humankind cannot afford that. Humankind needs to leave fossil fuels where they are to stay put in planet Earth. And to do that, we need to take actions at all levels. Obviously, citizen actions, we need to raise awareness because we mustn't forget that in our parliament, the third political group is a political party that ignores science. Well, they ignore science and they actually say no. They deny this situation. I mean, excuse me, sir, you can ignore what you can you want. But as Galileo said, it, it is round and it moves, right? So uh, as it happens in other countries, uh, I mean, but this, they, they, are, they are not right. They have just vested interests. Obviously, vested interests that are, you know, they can't even admit. But we know that the science is in our hand. I don't have any vested interest. I All I want is that my daughters and my grandchildren live in a healthy planet, which is not the case now. So I was reading earlier, and I was watching CNN yesterday. On the 17th of November, for the first time, we have overcome levels for the first time before pre-industrial levels. So we need to be rare, ready for that. So this is a really urgent situation, and we don't have time. Time is running out. So now we have around 220 gigatons of CO2 until we reach a potential of 50% of uh, warming at more than 0 0.5. Each day we uh, have 40 ton emission. So if you multiply that, we truly have only one decade available to not go beyond 1.5 degrees increase. So we need to do curb emissions a lot and now. Yeah, well, it's clear. We know what we need to do. This is an issue of download speed, right? It's not, we, we need to do it continuously and fast. But can we request the same pace of change in all regions of the world? Or can we ask polluters to give us more be more responsible, sort of like as a proportional levels. It is normally been said that we are all involved in it. We have common responsibilities, but differentiated responsibilities. The big emissions came from the US and Europe, 
and we have greater responsibilities. However, when the Kyoto Protocol was drafted, they excluded the developing countries because they had low emissions at the time. <coughs> but we have seen how at the end of 1997 to now, a country which was developing as China moved from me having low emissions to becoming the main em source of emissions. And it is true that what they, the emissions they are creating, we buy their products or we can't be cynical. They are having emissions because we buy things. So the, respons the greater responsibilities are on our, our side. But as I said, the urgency is so huge that we can't afford to have India, who, which has increasing emissions, to continue in that path because it will be uncontrollable. And since we don't have time because the figures are what they are, I mean, it's not that we have like a few decades ahead of us to wait. No, no, no. We just, it's around the corner. And, the, and I remind people that by mid October, we had a climate emergency in the Canary Islands and children could not go to school because of a heat wave. And that happened in mid-October. So we are way beyond what could be managed. I mean, if you allow people who are not developed or countries uh, that are investing in energy policies. In, in energy policies need investments with a 40-year time frame. And if we, they continue like this for the next 40 years, there is no potential solutions. So all countries, based on their possibilities, they only have one possibility, which is to be aligned and to change the model, because we need to change the model. And we cannot allow South Africa, for example. South Africa says, we'll have a lot of carbon, and, and I can use it. And But we need to say, well, if you allow you to keep on using it, we will end up like China. So common responsibilities, differentiated responsibilities. We need to take greater steps. The EU has been the leader of this. The US hasn't. The US has actually just put, been putting sticks in, hammers in the wheels. I remember Bush Jr. decisions uh, on carbon plants that were built at his time, like 20 years ago, and they are still operational, and they have those plants. And uh, because the energy coming from fossil fuels today is not competitive anymore. So that is what has happened. That energy is not competitive anymore. So they made a mistake, Bush made a mistake, and we cannot allow them to make any more bad decisions. So that's the dilemma where we are. We are more responsible, but we need to bring everything together and not leave anyone behind. And actually what you have to do is to change a little bit the politics of international relations. And therefore an organization as the Red Cross is one of the basic roles that we can see. What is the role of international relations? Once win, others lose. U.S. will earn more power and China will diminish. And that is a constant gain when there is a lose and win. And the Brooklyn Report, which is one of the most important in this uh, fight and struggle against uh, climate change, has the subtitle saying a common future. That is of the whole of the planet. And therefore, we need to reach geopolitical situation. It's not a matter that what I earn, you lose. But we have to win all together and become a win-win situation. When you speak about this, the logic is a different one. And that is the logic that we have to change. And then is what I'm asking, actually, is what is the debate that we have to implement? And Jose Manuel, as you said, that is one of the basic ideas in this dialogue. Why should I pay more? And why, if I'm not the most pollutant country, why I have to have different responsibilities? But climate change has 
has a characteristic that has difficulties on time and on uh, space. What we are suffering today is not a consequence of what we are, uh, the missions of today, but what w the missions of many years ago. So this means that the missions of today will be suffered in a future for future generations. So there is an interrelationship from today's emission with the future. And that means that we have to reach certain agreements in which we have to trust today for a future. So that means that we have to change the logics of international relationships. And therefore, that's another difficult issue. So this means that we have to assume responsibility. We have the richer part of the world, the most developed countries in the world, we have to facilitate and we have to guarantee more sustainable ways of living. In order not to create the different challenge of sustainability, which is a difference and a common future. And therefore, we need to see what is uh, the uh, conversation dialogue at the level of policies that we need to have uh, to be more generous. And that is for our own benefit, because if that does not fit with an lowering emissions, it would not be useful. And we have to be very rigorous in the Western world. And that means that in a future, we need to be very much aware of, I assisted in, a, in some weeks ago, the Secretary General presented the plan for future emissions and pollution, and at the end she said, we are going to make all our efforts in order to uh, comply with all these objectives, but we know very much and we are very much aware that we have an incidence of less than 5% of uh, the production by China. But that's not the logic because, of course, China uh, emits and pollutes with a lot of coal. They are very much based on renewable, but you shouldn't forget the agreement that China had signed with the European Union, there was a, a commitment of redu a reduction of emissions, and therefore, as Jose Manuel said, we have to acknowledge what is the effort that we all carry out. And the fact that others do not implement and comply with this, no, this is a world for everybody, and we are all responsible. So there's, that's the reason of why we should change the logics. I don't know if Jose Manuel agrees with me. In each meeting of the COP, of the COP, we have to change these uh, logics. And here, it is very important, it is very important to uh, insist that uh, this is the basic idea. And here, we have to be aware that these uh, ideas and reasonings are more and more into politics. So we need to change our model. We need to be aware that this that has been the cause of a problem, we have to provide a different idea because otherwise we will continue merged in the problem. And as Jose Manuel said, we have to reach hand in hand to every of the parties involved. And I think that's something really essential because who are the important uh, stakeholders of this issue? What are the migrants that are arriving to the U.S.? That's all of Central America that are having important problems on climate change, and people do not manage to eat. What are the migrants that we receive here in Europe? Uh, uh, Syrian immigrants? We have the problem of the Sahel. There are many, many people that are going to arrive here sooner than later. So that, the fact that we are narrow-sighted and short-sighted and say, I live in my flat, in my village, in my autonomous community here in Spain, that does not longer exist. And the world has become a wider world. And when people have nothing to eat, they will move elsewhere. So that's why we have to change our model. So what can we do 
in order so that these regions that are advancing would uh, become a leader for the rest of transitions elsewhere. First thing is uh, to be aware of the commitment. I feel very, very proud as a European citizen, and I'm not going to list uh, the reasons because then everybody will tell me, well, that's not that important. The important thing is to see what are, where is the solution. The Europeans, we, we are decreasing our emissions, achieving our wealth, improving our development, and we've done things much better than in other areas of the world. When I was 17 years old, I was lucky enough to live in the States, and at that point then, they already had an important quality of life that was amazing. And afterwards, and what have they learned for all this uh, time? Gadgets, games, but they already had the basic things from the very beginning. The substantial things were already there. So if we want a world that we want to add more gadgets and more gadgets and more little toys and that sort of thing, we'll keep on adding to the list. But that's not a good policy. And the world is not for this. So the responsibilities are shared responsibilities, and we have to look with a certain perspective. We need to be very much aware. In the beginning of last century, there was this movement in which the modern world has to assert they are many cities that are built as smart cities. It means there's uh, transportation and throughout it the different housing facilities. And there are many, many uh, villages, uh, cities, smart cities that are built in this matter. But after you stop and look at it and say, who has planned this? It's not feasible to continue living in this manner. We are in this situation because we haven't done things properly, because we haven't followed a guide. And at the very beginning of the 20th century, we had very little knowledge about everything. And today, we have a lot of knowledge for many things. We know how to build cities in order to guarantee much better life, much better quality of life. And that's a reflection that has to lead us to consider many, many things. Climate change has not been a reflection of a bad vision of the future. We, there are certain limits, and climate change are, is establishing those limits. So I wanted to ask you, how, what should we do in order to see I agree with what uh, Jose Manuel said. We have more knowledge, more technology, and more funds than ever. So why aren't we implementing this in a much better manner? But actually, I think that the main challenge that we have today for this change of model is very much in relation to governance. Who will take decisions in order to implement it in an efficient manner? And this is done through agreements, through agreements that it's not only a matter of an agreement with a, um, a, a a town hall, a government, but this it requires bottom-up agreements. It requires a lot of empathy, being aware that this transition has to be a win-win situation. It has, uh, we need a fair transition with no losers. And now it's very much in trend to reflect about the need of rethinking about social contract. This social contract that we implemented after the Second World War in which 
we all grew up in which we have had a huge degree of social well being of health well being education etc that was a very important turning point with Reagan and Thatcher it became a neoliberal social agreement and social agreement after the financial crisis of uh, 2008 and after the COVID pandemic, we see that the stake parties are rethinking of the role. The debate is not a matter of knowing the size of the state, but what is the role of the public sector? And then we find um, reasoning as, for example, the case of Machucato, in which there are certain stakeholders that have to play a more important role, or that the companies, the business, understand that for being accepted socially, they need a purpose, an objective, and if to after in the academia, in knowledge, we need a requirement which is to become useful for social transformation. And that is what civil society is being aware. So this means that we have to rethink of this social agreement, of this social framework to have a new role. And the social agreement implies an environment for all, it requires a framework within sustainability. And if the agreements of this sustainability framework are not complying with sustainability criteria, then it's not valid. So we have to be aware that we have to rethink important issues as, for example, social agreement or even in Europe, we have to rethink our idea of social well-being. We need to think about the different social agreement on the year 2000 in which it is more and more important what sustainability is asking for us and therefore we need to know what are the equitable principles within sustainability framework and we have to think of many, many things. And this that is the important challenge that we have in front of us. And here we have to be aware that the good news is that this is already being implemented. And today this is the topic. And we are not the only ones to deal with this topic. There are more and more private and and public seminars in which we debate this issue. Jose Manuel and, and myself, we are debating on this topic once and again. We come from the different companies, very important companies within our country, and the companies are already aware of this topic for many, many years. I remember a conversation I had in Toronto with a very important oil company in Toronto, and they told me, we need to sell something. I am very much aware that in 50 years from now, we will continue to sell something. I don't know what we will sell, but the important thing is to see that what they sell, they need a profit. They will sell the solar panels, they will sell whatever commodity. They will change their commodity probably, but they'll have to sell something to earn a profit. And therefore, all these policies within the frameworks, and then my question would be the following. Is this a good excuse to continue speaking and how do we do to regulate this? And then I will go to the next question because we are a little bit uh, tied about uh, the 2030 agenda and what is the role played by SDGs. I think that companies, the big companies, well, small and medium-sized companies, they have no option of doing anything. But the big companies, that they are clearly the trend 
And I think that there has been a big change here because the big oil companies from the 30s already knew what was going to happen with the climate change. And therefore, there were specific models that they were very, very specific. And the uh, top management uh, silenced uh, this conclusions and they said on the contrary not to be twingling on this idea we cannot ignore these anymore and we cannot conclude that these countries that they had their own projections and that they want to continue selling their oil will continue trying so and many of the big oil companies they already know that their horizon has changed and that they are taking and many of the decisions are very much in relation with climate change. They cannot continue acting as uh, the big monsters of our century. And I imagine that in the future when we start measuring the carbon footprint, then that day is going to be very difficult and it's going to be very important how you reflect your footprint. Mr. Trump arrived to the president of the U.S. saying that he was going to create many, many jobs in the coal industry. And Mr. Obama, that wrote a wonderful article, said, I am in this not because I like it and enjoy it, but because I have to create many, many jobs in renewable energy. And Mr. Trump did not create a single job in carbon industry, and Obama did create many jobs in renewables. So this is why it is very important that we focus on our objectives. I really think that many companies are very much aware of this new situation of the recirculation of our commodities, our, our products. We've already reached every single corner of the planet, and therefore you have to enter in this from the economic viewpoint. You have to be more efficient from the energetic energy viewpoint. Efficiency is very, very important, and it depends on us. It is very important on what we do, because the third, amazingly enough, the third party in our parliament is a negation. It, it, it is against climate change and does not believe in climate change. So many people would are still not aware that looking backwards is not the solution. To live better is not a matter of kicking our planet that has no future whatsoever. To use and continue using the planet, polluting, as was the case during the 50s, during the 60s, many people are not aware of this, and they feel they have to make an effort, and therefore they have to be tight on this. Don't look backwards. Just look forward. To look backwards is not a positive strategy. It's not going to give you good actions, and it's going to delay your position and your strategy. So we have to convince everybody. We have to convince the citizen so that people trust on science. And if it were not for science, I'm sure that we would already be uh, totally dead and cemeteries would be growing and growing. But that is the fact. And that was possible thanks to science. In science, during the COVID pandemic, we could overcome the huge obstacle that we had in front of us. It is true that science has many interests, the same as in many other areas of the world. We have many scientists that, at the end of the day, they are shareholders of big companies as well. Yeah, that is a fact, but the basic ideas are facts. 
everybody knows how to work in the scientific world so you ask the whole set of scientists and the panel as United Nations that's what we have to focus on and we have to bring back people and we have to convince people to trust in science because nobody will fix your life except science people that really were solving and overcoming the obstacles that we faced during the COVID pandemic. Those are the scientists that will help us. We, the scientists, if we are asked of what to do, and if we are capable of giving an answer, giving an answer based on data. And nobody can provide more data than scientists. So we have to bring back trust on science. And that is the strategy to implement. The term greenwashing comes from an ecologist uh, movement of saying that many big companies, they were lying, saying that they had green commodities when this was not true. There has been a new directive approved just passed in the European uh, Union, a European directive, greenwashing, that they have to prove that the things that they do in relation to uh, greenwashing, it's a fact. It's an ecological movement uh, word that it was birth at that moment, and now it's the title of a European directive, and that has changed in four days. It's true that it has to be much, much faster, but almost in four days, this change has become a reality. And as Jose Manuel said, we were in a specific forum in which this directive affects what are the, the conditions that we have to do, and we have gone forward. You asked about the 2030 agenda. Oh, what Jose Manuel said, this 2030 agenda, it's like the roadmap to build a future, a future for everybody, although not everybody supports it. In the beginning, everybody was very happy with it, but now there are many political parties one of the first ideas that they uh, are on denial on the agenda 2030. We've seen it in Spain. And I was amazed because on the one hand, all of those that we are trying to promote 2030 agenda, and we never managed to get so well conveyed in order to uh, the fact that nobody understands actually. Uh, but why is there so much opposition to these 2030 on how to create a common future? And that's why they uh, win elections, people that are not worth while winning elections. But we have to understand why people support and vote for those op political options. And I think it is very interesting as well to understand what is our feeling in different parts of the world, in Europe, in the US, in Latin America. What we are seeing is that we live within a reality in which when we consider what are the main challenges that we have in front of us, we have migrations, climate change, meaning to lower emissions. That is something that most of uh, society understand, but they all immediately answer and say that we live in a changing world full of uncertainties. And when you see that most of these politicians, they're men that they say this is a huge lie and to go back is to be in a trustworthy situation. If they tell you climate change is a lie, 
and you are afraid of climate change, then the best thing is to listen and to hear that that is not true. That's a huge lie. Imagine if you need to reach a level of equality for the women's role, then when you arrived home, you know very well what was the role you as a husband and you as a wife. You know perfectly what is your role, and then those are things that are good to marketing, and because we are in a changing situation in where fear is one of the main assets and uncertainty is there. But the main challenge of our governance is that we need to be aware that our situation, our citizens, and that's what we measure in barometers, in surveys, is that people are very much afraid of an uncertainty environment. And we need certain truths in order to implement this. When I saw that in demonstrations, I asked, but what what you don't like from the uh, SDGs to avoid hunger? What is you don't like about these SDGs, uh, the goals that we have established? Because if you start reading the different SDGs and you say, how on earth can you be against this? Because all of this is very, very logical. And we need this strategy of teaching people that we want to eliminate poverty, to assist a school, uh, to have a clear future. And at the end of the day, that is what our objective uh, with SDG that women are not killed for the mere uh, reason of being a woman, killed by the husband, by the boyfriend, by uh, the neighbor, and no, is that what you would like? So I lived in that specific moment uh, as uh, being a member of humanity because I really understood that these people were not human beings and they did not understand what they were living. So we really have to teach people so that this is the situation in which we are living because that hides many bad situations. Perhaps it would be much easier for me as a husband to say, I am the one to control the situation within my family. But if that is the case, it's because there are many women that they are killed. You do not accept the rights of the woman. And I, that's something I cannot accept as a human being. So we have to convey this message. We have to launch this conviction because we really want to live better. And I don't see why we should go against. That's the best definition for sustainability. Sustainability is that we all manage to live better. Today's citizens and tomorrow's citizens to live better. And now we are going to define what is to live better. So that is the, the best definition of sustainability. Unfortunately, we have to close this debate uh, but because we are running late already. But I'm going to ask you, what do you think about the COP meeting, the COP28, that's starting next week? And what are the opportunities that the climate change will have and the different technological advances on this COP summit that is going to be celebrating in Dubai next week. This gives you, this gives us the opportunity of rethinking many of the to hot topics of our society that are not very, very clear. The climate change changes everything, so it's an important uh, factor of change that if we rethink about it will give us the opportunity of going much in depth on many, many issues that are not clear. So this definition of sustainability is an opportunity that is given to us to live better. COP28, as every single year after this summit, 
many people that would go if we have gone forward and it will be another team of people that will say has not been very very useful so after these summits i've already learned when i come back is not to see whether the glass is half empty or half full but the idea is to see if we are improving and if we are improving at a good pace and that's important so i hope that when we are back on the 12th of December or 13th of December from this summit is that we will know very clearly what is the commitments of the different governments as far as the decrease of emissions. An assessment of the figures which clearly are not enough. A renewed political desire of implementing all of this at a global level, because this is a global future and a global challenge, not only of one part of the world. It is true that for the uh, last years, we have been improving at the pace that we want. No, but we continue to improve. Jose Manuel, what do you think? Well, we have taken stock of the commitments from the countries and it seems that they have not made sufficient commitments so they will need to bring new proposals to align their commitments with their needs to curb emissions. So from that point of view, it is very important. Christina has explained it really well. So we need to continue having 1.5 as a goal. 1.5 is our goal. I know it's difficult, I know it's hard, but two days ago, they published a paper on the, the sea level rise that two degrees would mean. And people are seeing that maybe we go to eight to, ten to 12 meters of sea level rise. And uh, we will see that. So we cannot afford two degrees. We cannot afford 1.5. And 1.5 should be our goal. Because I'm sure that Sultan, uh, whatever, will put many spanners in the works. I mean, there was a commitment in Glasgow, but uh, it's not just removing carbon, but it's removing fossil fuels. And all these sultans will resist. But I hope that the European Union would will put pressure as much as they can. So with these two goals, if we don't give them up, at least we stay alive. Okay, we know where we are. We know where we want to go to. You have said words such as commitments, common future, cross-cutting agreements. Now we can't stay only with words, but we can actually land words into action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, they are beautiful mugs. Anyway, well, thank you very much, Jose Manuel. After listening to you, uh, we can feel that science is so important. And Christina has used the word uncertainty. Uncertainty can have a plus side, and we need to explore that. Well, now I would like to ask you if you could do me a favor. I need your commitment to do something. I am going to ask you to do something. Please move to the chair to your right. So that means that people who are in the corner will have to go all the way to the other side. So move your chair, move to the chair you are, you have to your right. So just move to the right. So yeah, to your right, yeah, move to the chair. So if you are working, you can stay. I, you are excused because you are working. And the rest, of the, you, all you are doing is changing seats. Have you changed seats? Have you moved seats? Okay. It was just a little energizer that I have asked you to do. This is a micro migration. You have moved to empathize in a way, because I guess it was uncomfortable for you to move to your right. And yeah. For the next panel that we are going to talk about, has to do with this, with migrations. 
So temp extreme temperature and climate change is forcing lots of people in many places in the world to forcibly change location. You have suffered a bit just by changing seats. Imagine what they are going through. Before I forget, I wanted to show you that a colleague of mine, Laura, she is a graphic facilitator and she's doing an amazing job of, she's a rapporteur, but she's doing a graphic drawing of what the conclusions that have been said. So thank you, Laura, you are doing a beautiful job. Now in this migration round table, it's called when the climate hinders life. So we have two experts on this subject matter. They are Raquel and Gonzalo. So please come on stage whilst I introduce you. I'm going to ask you to change a seat now. It was a joke. It was only a joke. Okay, so we're going to talk about this. Raquel Fernandez Gibaja, she is a coordinator for Europe of migrations and displacements of the International Federation of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Societies. We have Gonzalo Sánchez with us, his deputy director of humanitarian programs for the Center for International Humanitarian Cooperation at the Fordham University in New York. And of course, our colleague Salome, who is going to chair this panel. So let's give them all a round of applause. Welcome. Thank you very much. We're going to talk about migrations. And migration is intrinsic to human beings. It is an age-old activity that has marked almost all human societies without exception. But why are we going to talk about migration today? Well, in this recent decades, its evolution has changed. The magnitude of migration ranges from the distance they've traveled, the frequency of the journey within the life trajectory of people, the profile of migrants, and the cause that provokes the need to migrate. So this is where there is a link, migration, environment, and climate. This link, migration, environment, and climate is becoming more pressing. So we can talk about typhoons, floods, and fires, or slow onset processes such as sea level rise and land degradation. Which environmental and climatic factors play a role today in people's decision to leave their country of origin in search of a better future? What is the current situation regarding forced migration due to environmental factors? So we start with you, Raquel. Thank you very much for your invitation. And um, this is a complex phenomenon. It's multifaceted. It is not linear, especially when we talk about climate change and its environmental effects. Individual decisions of people to migrate are a combination of different factors that play a role in that decision. So environmental and climate factors are droughts, lack of resources, tropical storms, and uh, migrations. And they are causing different type of uh, phenomenon. People who migrate directly because their homes have been destroyed or even their, their personal lives have been lost but we also have the indirect part, which means that people are not directly affected, they are indirectly affected, in which their income is gradually, or their way of life is gradually affected. So it is climate phenomena are only one part of the reasons and factors that force people to this place. So we have named in a few occasions the IPCC 
regulation, the decrease of directions, and these risks, these climate risks cause more and more displacements. The, there is a 40 percent, around 3,500 million people living in areas that are very exposed to climate change. And we have data stating that these displacements occur internally, and they are the first step to cross borders. The Global Observatory of Internal Displacements is in charge of collecting this data. We will be talking about this later. So they said that from 2018 to 2018, there has been 200 and 125 displacements, which is not the same thing as displaced people. And in 2022, there is 41% more displacements than the average of the last 10 years. So if we take the last 10 years, the average of those years, well, the last year was 41% more than the average. But we also need to take into account the fact that when these displacements occur due to a punctual disaster, all these people can then come back to their country of origin, to their community, to their city, to their village. But we know that there are other climate events that are more slow in evolution that actually cause a permanent long-term displacement. In 2022, there was 8.7 internal displaced people who would never go back to their countries of origin, and they are in countries such as Pakistan, Philippines, India, China, Nigeria. And some data are interesting. 25% of the displacements in 2022 were caused by in floods in Pakistan. Pakistan is a country with structural problems, poverty problems, and suddenly we started to join the dots. And, uh, and then we would go across the borders. So we see the trends and we see how Pakistani people are ex leaving the country. And they are part of the 10 nationalities that were in Europe. And uh, in 2023, they are the fifth. Is this a coincidence? Well, I don't think so. In 2022, there were one million people who were displaced in Somalia due to one of the biggest droughts in, in there in the last 40 years. So we joined the dots and we started getting the figures. But I would like to point out that all these people displacing internally or crossing borders are people who can move but there are other people who, due to these climate events, they, they could not go anywhere. They could not move. And they are in areas which are really exposed to these risks. And the reality could be that they don't, ha they don't have the need to move. But it's much more concerning than that, is that some of them cannot move and other people decide not to move. But we cannot ignore the interaction between climate events and migrations. The interaction is not linear. It doesn't affect everybody in the same way. And not everybody has the capacity to adapt to these events. So when migrating is feasible, people who are left behind are much more vulnerable. Recently, I was in Ethiopia in the border between two regions, Tigray and Afar, and I have worked for more than 25 years in humanitarian response in conflict areas on education. 
So I was asked to go and visit a school in a village called Agada. The area is very poor and the environmental degradation is obvious. When I got off my car in this village, I saw that the whole village came to my car, which is very rare when you go and visit a school. As I was getting off the car, the first thing they asked me is, are you the water man? And I was like, oh God, no, I'm here to visit a school. And I saw in their faces the despair uh, to my answer, and they said to me, the school is closed. It's been closed for the last four months because we have no water. And since there is no water, the, the first people who leave this the village is people who can find a job somewhere else, which is literate people, people with studies, with education. And peasants cannot move out. And the next thing they told me was, I mean, they, they had had three rainy seasons who had not happened. A northern NGO had built a water tank with on a roof, and that should be able to provide water. But of course, there was no rain, so the water tank was dry. So they said to me, if the next rainy season fails, they have two rainy seasons, one short and one long. They said, if the rainy season fails, we, we, we set off and we move, we go somewhere else. So we, when we hear about climate migration on paper, it's interesting. But when you see them and you meet them and they tell them that they're ready to go, then that's amazing. So I realized that there were two hypotheses. One, catastrophic hypothesis, and then the other one is apocalyptic hypothesis. There is no other way around, because figures are like ten, tens of thousands of million of people or a hundred of million of people. One of the most enlightening reports was the one presented by the World Bank for COP26. Um, I have worked in Sub-Saharan Africa, in, in Trans-Sahel Africa, and they talk about 86 million climate migrations for uh, 2050. So in 25 years' time, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there would be 86 million displaced people due to climate. And only in the Western Africa, there would be 32 million people. And the World Bank, which, as you know, is not a Marxist-inspired organization. They are very moderate. They are very cautious. And they always talk about internal displacement, which is absurd. Because if you are from Mali, how many times are you going to go to Burkina Faso, or if you're from Burkina Faso to Niger? We all know that they will go somewhere else. And when we talk about today, because, I mean, we're talking about huge figures. We've talked about Somalia. I worked in the border between Ethiopia and Somalia. And Somalia is amazing because last year, there were more than 100 million people moving due to the drought. It was a severe drought. The first time I went there to the Ethiopian Somalia border in 2011, they said that there was the worst drought in 60 years. So there was five refugee camps in the border on the Ethiopian part. Since then, there have been more droughts, more severe than in 2011. The last one was last year when more than one people displaced. This year, we have more than half a million displaced people in Somalia due to the floods. So climate is really destroying and changing the life of people. And this is pushing people to move. And there is something. And I mean, we've talked about the different causes that mix together. And for me, this is key. We talk about climate, but we also talk about conflict. As you very well know, I mean, there are so many reasons to be terrified nowadays, but we don't talk much about Sudan. In Sudan, there have been so many displacements in the last few months, as in the first months of the Ukrainian war. And it's kind of interesting when it comes to information, the information we receive from one conflict and another. So more than 6 million people have had to flee their homes in Sudan in the last half year. 
so the place where the its wars is in Darfur. Those who remember the 2003 Darfur war, and in that war there was a clear link. It was a correlation between drought, repeated droughts in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in that part of the world with the 2003 war. And that is occurring again. 400,000 people in the last few months have had to cross the border from Darfur to Chad to find shelter. And I would like to finish one, one piece of dramatic information. These people have moved from Sudan to Chad. They are settling in new refugee camps in Adre. And the problem today is that for those refugees who left their home looking for shelter in, in the hands of the international community, the amount of water we can give them for 400 million people is six liters per person per day. And we are at the Red Cross headquarters. This is the Sphere Manual. And the, the minimum would be 20 liters per person per day. And the question is, why can, can, can we only provide them six liters per day? Why? Because it's in Chad. Because they are living from a really dry, uber poor country to another poorer, drier country. So what we need to talk about is, where are these people going? Because we know they are moving, and the problem is not why, which is a huge problem, and it's a key issue. The next problem is where they are going, and what are we doing? Well, you've just said something that I would like to highlight, which is whether we should talk about climate refugees or climate migrants. What's the difference when it comes to human rights? If we say migrant or refugee, well, the difference is huge. Well, I am at the heart of the problem, and I know that I am talking today at the Red Cross headquarters. And when we talk about political realities, I always say that Lido now in his grave, he's doing like this, because for very good reasons, Red Cross has always been neutral. Thanks to that, the Red Cross has been able to respond in many conflicts. But when it comes to humanitarian response, you cannot take a step without clashing into the political situation. And calling a panel climatic, climate migration, this is a political event because you're avoiding the word refugee. And the difference between two words is key. Refugee has a legal com component from the 1951 convention, and we know that migrations are not considered as a uh, migrate as mi climate caused migrations. And however, in the world we live in, people will not stay in their country. People will cross their borders. And we all know if we have met any migrants ever, we know the difference between arriving to a country as a migrant or arriving to a country as a refugee. The difference is the rights you hold. And I've talked about this for many ye years. I have two hats. I work for a university, and I, ha I am a humanitarian worker. And for years, when we talked about climate refugees, they were only bad news. There's not a crack of hope there. But things are beginning to change. In 2020, the UN Commission on Human Rights, after a ruling due to a displacement of Kibati man to New Zealand, the UN said that due to climate change, countries could not deport people back if their life was at risk. Is the no devolution principle. And uh, that was the first crack, the first light of hope. The Australian government reached an agreement with the Tuvalu nation state to allow that, due to climate re reasons, 280 people a year could obtain a working permit and a humanitarian visa for Australia. And this all has political implications. 
why are governments being so generous? Well, the fine print of this agreement between Australia and Tuvalu, I mean, it, it, is, it is really, really relevant for us to talk about this. Tuvalu, in exchange of Australia accepting climate refugees, they commit, and this is surprising, they commit not to reach any security agreement with a third country without asking Australia first. And you know who the third country is, right? That they are scared of at the mm, Sea of China and the Southeast of Asia. But the reality is that a state, for the first time, is accepting the concept of climate refugee. The first panel would be, this is the topic today, from the humanitarian perspective, our fight is to create an international framework for legal protection for people who are displaced due to climate change. But as Raquel said, they will be able to go back to their country of origin, but many more, and that is my fear, will not. And they are proving it today. Two weeks ago, I was in Mexico, and as it was mentioned in the first panel, a substantial part of people arriving to Mexico come from the dry corridor, Guatemala, Salvador, and Honduras. So they are coming from Peru and Ecuador, where El Nino effects are devastating. And they will get worse. So this is a global problem affecting people differently. The question is, with the political and geopolitical scenario, is it realistic to open the fight for the 1951 convention uh, questioning, or can we create tools that allow for the protection? So humanitarian organizations, which have always been quiet, not to disturb countries when it comes to rights, so for humanitarian organizations from the academia and for civil society, they have to be able to take that into account. But there are different voices in the UN Committee for Refugees, uh, and uh, they always acknowledge that opening up this issue is removing rights from refugees. And there are other tools, such as the Declaration of Cartagena, and the Convention of the African Union, which are tools adhered to the 1951 protocol, but they are of regional scope, which have opened up this gap. And there is a gap. And you can see how they also acknowledge people who displaced due, displaced due to severe problems in the countries, and there is where they are included, the degradation of the soil. And there are some other examples. In 2010 and 2011, Kenya and Ethiopia acknowledged certain people from Somalia due to the famine that was caused by the drought and they were given some sort of international permit protection. So we are there. There's still a lot of discussion to take place. Yeah, the words are very important because Cartagena is a declaration. It's not a convention. It's only a declaration. And for Cartagena, we saw the value we had when the massive displacement of Venezuelan people happened and countries did not fulfill their commitments from the Cartagena 1984 Convention. The Kampala Convention for the African Union is for internal displacement. And we have many things to talk about. But I am very concerned when the UNHRCR says that we don't talk about climate refugees because we would lose protection from the 1951 refugees. I mean, but that approach is like a lose-lose approach because if we don't say things, if we don't fight for our dreams, we will permanently live in the trenches. And this is applicable to COP and to everything. Of course. How come we cannot ask for the rights that we think are of fair? because we are afraid of losing other rights. I mean, seriously, this is very dangerous. This is a very dangerous concept. So actually, the idea is how do we introduce in this general uh, idea, and how do we 
convey the message. I think it is very important uh, in this humanitarian crisis from your experience, from your organizations, to, uh, s is this managed differently when this migration crisis uh, is derived from climate change or from different causes? Well, yes, there's a difference. The basic international federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent societies are the first ones that are uh, responding to climate change and climate crisis has been responding. And we are going to continue investing in this response. But the focus for the last years has been in other issues, preparation to prevention and especially in adapting communities in this specific changing cri uh, climate events or crisis. So we try to understand what are the risks uh, that the community, no matter where they live, in no matter what region, in order to understand what will happen and why, how should we prepare these communities. But if the case occurs, we will have to respond. But we are trying to implement a good investment for prevention, and as my colleague said, to use scientific predictions that not only are going to give us prediction of climate disasters, but as well, what are the internal displacement rather than outside our borders, which is very many things that are very difficult to know what are the policies that we are going to implement in the different countries. But science does help us and it's very, very useful in integrating this when preventing disasters, when in the area of ban Bangladesh, for example, there is a refugee camp of Rohingyas that came from Myanmar in very difficult situations in a society that they had to face very important economic challenges. And the fact that we have to do some prevention of these communities, to do mapping of risks, early warning systems in order to be able to understand what are the risks of the population to translate and understand and convey the messages to these specific populations and to convert this into actions. And therefore, different areas, that is this refugee camp, one million people is much more safe because they're very exposed to these climatic events and climate crisis. And here we are working with the international climate diplomacy, which is very much interlinked uh, with the connections of the Red Cross to the different authorities in order to see how not to damage the displacement of these people. So we shouldn't consider displacement camps and refugee camps in those areas that are highly exposed to climate crisis. And some of the tools that we have available from our breast, that is our emergency funds, which are very, very agile. When there is a disaster, they're implemented within 24 hours to provide resources to the difficult, different stuff of Red Cross. And we have other investment which is being carried out in prevention. And here we had to prepare these communities so that next time that this happens, this will not occur in order to, to see what are the risks and what is the displacement rate and speed of these people. So we have implemented a global 
program, a resilience program with a specific pillar for displacement for climatic crisis, and that is where nationals, communities are identifying these risks based on science to prepare communities to support those people that will stay for personal reasons or because they have no other option, they cannot uh, move, and to go and support those communities that are have taken the decision of displacement and that their risks are at risk. For me, the most important idea is that the whole DNA is to respond to certain circumstances. And we have not had the ability of working in prevention. And not only this, but when we have received the different uh, early alert system in the case of Somalia, for example, in 2012, when we did have specific reports on the family agreements system, on the famine crisis, we did not have the possibility of generating enough resources, and we calculate that more than 250,000 people died in Somalia in that time. The system has improved. Yes, it has improved. But from the system of the Red Cross to the, all the other humanitarian associations is the more the visual that disaster is, that's when we receive the funds and that's when they respond. Drought. Those are very long procedures with very long impact and with very long consequences. And with the system that we have implemented, that is starting from the beginning, we give attention to specific areas and we are not enough prepared for this. So for us, this is essential and we are more and more able of supporting communities to be get ready to specific communities. And I have to confess that I have a problem too with what we are doing. We receive funds from the NHCR, from the different organizations because of their data. It's an important example in which we have the social network in case of a national disaster and everything, all the big donors, the UK, the US, to achieve that the communities will stay. So all the system works under the premises that you have to stay. I talk with the communities and I tell them, if we establish a system of insurance companies, if there is environmental disaster, you will stay here. And next year, you will be able to those crops, but will they be able to seed those crops? Can I sit? on the front of that community and convey them that the pattern of rainfall is going to improve next year. And I have my doubts whether the humanitarian system is providing or working for the political agenda of the donors that is in favor of the communities. Because the question that we have to ask ourselves, and in the previous uh, panel, they were speaking about this third political uh, strength of political party in Spain. If you can sit in that specific solution, what would you do in this specific case? And I ask myself, if I were that person, what, how would I work? I would implement this program for mitigating the causes, or would that be my answer, or would I find 
and answer in different areas. So I think that we are not serving the victims of these huge humanitarian disasters, only serving to the interests of the northern governments without considering a second option that is to work, to find a better life elsewhere. So that's the complicated fact. The fact that we incorporated our vision on, on the change in, in prevention, preparation, the management of the borders, the migration and integration in the future places, and considering the return if, in case it occurs. So working on all of this, what is the role played by sustainable development? Is this, it goes together, hand in hand? Well, sustainable uh, development, I imagine that most of you know very well what is the triple nexus, and for the general secretary has been very, very important to match peace and safety, development and sustainable development. And I think that this year for the first time, there's going to be one session dedicated, I think it's on the 3rd of December, dedicated to climate change, safety and conflicts. And I think that they want to match these three ideas. But for me, there is a problem here. And I think there is where it lies, the origin of sustainable, and most of us here really believe on SDGs, and uh, we understand how important they are. So here, we, we met together the 194 countries to focus on SDGs, and from 170 goals, it depends very much who are you going to understand, ask, it's between 15 and 20. So imagine any company in the world that in the end of their pathway, then they have met only a 10% of their objectives. And in the meeting of September, they realized that they had nothing changed from the beginning of SDGs. And from the very beginning, it's not that there is a worsening of climate change, but as well a deterioration of democracies in the world. Those countries that met together in 2015 are less democratic, and the ones that are going to meet now in the COP28 are less democratic. So they try to join together climate change, safety, and uh, sustainability, and they are contributing with the higher violence. Uh, for me, uh, in, uh, it's going to be celebrated in Dubai, COP28, and we all know the democratic characteristics. But at the same time, we know that they support, as far as weapons, one of their supporting the Sudan war with weapons. So peace, safety, climate change, until we don't uh, call everybody by their name, the climatic refugees and the countries that they are not contributing to climate change and that they are the geopolitical interests. I think that we have an objective, a mission, and for me the priority system, our worst sin has been a genetic sin, and that is not to say the truth to the countries from which we receive the money. Well, there's very little to be added to this. I think uh, from the Red Cross, here we have the seven principles, neutrality, 
I think that today the movement of uh, uh, the Red Cross, uh, the neutrality, partiality, independency, yes, that is what we are saying, and we find ourselves in difficult situations in which in neutrality is being challenged. And we are seeing this in every aspect in which uh, the Red Cross tries to be impartial. So we do try to decrease the risks in order to understand how this is interlinked with other factors. So when we ask people what was your reason of migrating there are certain studies of the World Bank, I think it was in Salvador, in Guatemala, in which they were asked this question, and less than 6% said that the real reason was climatic change. But there were other reasons that they were prioritized in some areas of Western Africa. And I asked you exactly the same. The percentage was as 5%. But we, if the question changed and we asked them, have climate change influenced uh, your reasons to migrate? Then we see that more than 50% answered yes. So all of this is interrelated with uh, the SDGs, uh, with the objectives that we have in the Red Cross and that most of the organizations we are trying to implement. As I mentioned before, uh, we represent the most of the public powers in our societies and we try to continue witnessing of the reality because our societies of uh, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent uh, societies is what we see on the voluntaries in most rural areas, mostly affected by climate change, by climate disasters, and what we do better from our movement is to translate what we see in what how we want to make those changes from the privileged position that we have. So we will stop on the coffee break. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Gonzalo, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we will have a short break, a 30 minute break. We will come back to the room at quarter to one. We are going to have a, a coffee. Thank you very much.
Okay, well, welcome back, especially to those of you who are online. It's just really nice to have a cup of coffee uh, when it's cold and um, it's, uh, we are all living in uh, shared atmosphere here. Of, uh, and we have another round table now, a uh, round table that adds power and depth to the topics we're dealing with. So we are very lucky. We are warm inside when it's cold outside and the other way around. But think about how many people today at this very same time are going through the extreme situation in the two opposite poles. Let me give you some dates. Nowadays there are 42 million people who are suffering energy poverty and at the world scale the figure multiplies by two. So to talk about a fair transition towards eradicating energy poverty. We are very lucky to have here with us today our colleague, the moderator, uh, Salome, who will be ch chairing this panel. And I will quickly introduce you to our two speakers, Ronan Mangan, head of units for social inclusion of the Red Cross EU liaison office. Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. And Jose Antonio Marina. Everybody knows him, but I will introduce him anyway, because uh, it's always very nice to listen to him. He is a philosopher, an essay writer. He is a researcher and creator of the theory of intelligence, which I will quote him, if I may, Jose Antonio, to say. I think intelligence is an admirable and stubborn creator of fictions used to approach reality. So let's approach reality. Salome, you have the floor. Welcome, Ronan and Jose Antonio. We're going to talk about energy empowerment for a more equal future. SDG 7 pursues affordable and clean energy, and it seems that is one of the sustainable development goals where the most and best progress is being made. Energy is certainly becoming more sustainable and more widely available. Access to electricity in the poorest countries has started to accelerate. Energy efficiency continues to improve, and renewable energy is, uh, is doing really well in the power sector. But nevertheless, according to the UN, it's necessary to pay greater attention to improving access to clean and safe cooking fuels and technologies for three billion people to expand the use of renewable energy beyond the power sector and to increase electrification in sub-Saharan Africa and finish of the quote of the UN. So to begin with, in this dialogue, let's talk about the title of this roundtable. I remind you, it's called Energy Empowerment for a More Equal Future. So what do we mean when we talk about energy empowerment? Question number one. Ronan, for you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Makes sense. I don't hear myself. Um, first and foremost, I think we talk about, I mean, from my perspective, when we talk about empowerment, we have to work from the perspective of our recognition that there is a power imbalance, both social, political, economic, you know, that we have certain sectors of society who are able to access certain services and goods that other um, people in society are not able to, to access. So I think this is the, the, a departure point that we need to understand and recognize. Um, but where do we go from that in terms of, in terms of uh, assigning a meaning to the word uh, empowerment? I think what we need to do is, is we, you know, we, we can't empower people, but we can create you know, the, the processes for people to empower themselves. So from that perspective, we need to uh, enable, in particular, vulnerable uh, communities, vulnerable populations, uh, those who are socially excluded. I think we all know uh, normally who these uh, uh, communities are and who, who represents those communities as well, um, to uh, you know, provide them the necessary knowledge, necessary tools to understand, exercise and realize both their human and their social rights, so that they do have, uh, indeed, a, Uh, the necessary uh, information and knowledge to, uh, uh, to ensure their broader social inclusion and, uh, and general well-being. But it can't be seen as a one-way process. It's not one-way traffic because, yes, we can work to support uh, the empowerment of uh, vulnerable groups, but there's also an onus on the side of decision-makers, the ones who hold the power, 
to understand that yes, uh, you know, these groups have uh, specific uh, specific rights, and we have a responsibility to these groups to realise, or at least to support the realisation of those rights. If I could give an example, I mean, we very often talk about, or at least at European level, we very often talk about the need to consult with hard-to-reach communities or hard-to-reach individuals. Huh? So, one of the things that could be done within this context is that a meaningful uh, uh, and inclusive consultation process can be undertaken with vulnerable communities to better understand their needs, to better understand how these needs can met, and then to ensure that you know, these are included in uh, national, regional, and local strategies when we talk about energy poverty, for example, and that, again, from a responsibility perspective, decision makers work progressively, uh, inclusively, and together with other actors to ensure that these, uh, these strategies are implemented um, at, the, at, the, uh, at the, the, the different levels I just, uh, I just mentioned. However, not to be negative about it, I mean, but we, but we have to be also a bit realist, and, and maybe for coming from a social justice background, I have to be realist. I mean, the idea of uh, energy empowerment uh, is an incredibly rare pursuit. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a political uh, exercise uh, very, very often, and in that context, the, the, the narrative of the consultation process is also incredibly narrow and lacks any form of depth uh, in terms of consulting with those communities uh, who are most at need, I would say, of uh, quote-unquote uh, empowerment. So for me, that's, uh, that's the, the, the kind of key three or four uh, points I mean, that we, we need to consider when we talk about uh, empowerment, more broadly speaking. Okay, Jose Antonio, from your point of view, before I start, I want to ask you a question, which is really important, which is, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Because I cannot hear anyone. I can't even hear what Ronan is saying because of the echo in the room. The, he said, literally, the issue of energy must be dealt with in a broader sense so that then we can descend to the empowerment itself. In 1993, an anthropologist, Leslie Wilde, published the evolution of cultures, which had a great impact because it related the level of culture with the level of energy consumption and with efficiency in the processes to use energy. So the writer talked about the complexity of the culture based on the type of energy consumption this culture had. Recently, there's been a book called hunters, farmers, and carbon, which says that culture can be divided according to the energy consumption there's been, reduced to joules, which is the energy unit. He used calories because he's more plastic, more visual. So he said that the used in calories consumption has moved from 2,500, 3,000 calories, which is what our ancestors consumed in their prehistory to 230,000 calories, which is what the average American takes as an average. So th that is all, all that they consume because everything an American consumes it has an energy component. And this is something that I will always explain to my students. Whenever they consume something, there is a previous energy expenditure from the shirt they buy at Zara to the mobile phone they are using. So the author of this book said, we are at an energy consumption level which is truly high, which cannot be generalized to the whole world. Like not everyone can use 260,000 calories a, a day, 230,000 calories a day. So the problem we have is what happens when the least developed countries wants to have the same level of development as us, and then there is a potential for the whole thing to collapse. Secondly, one thing is energy, and the other one is that 
there is not an energy a problem with energy is that there are social problems of production and use on energy meaning that underneath each energy power problem there is a relationship of power of interests simplifying everything Iraq war was based on oil industry interests the reason why nobody has researched on clean energy for such a long time or hydrogen energy for a long time was because there were vested interests against it. So that's the general approach, which has to do with the problem we've dealt with this morning of climate change, meaning that it is produced due to using one specific type of energy. And then it has to do with migrations. Migrations wants to move to areas where the individual energy consumption is higher because the problem that underdeveloped countries have is that the potential of accessing energy sources is very small, including food amongst them, obviously food being a source of energy. So I think we should be used to explaining to people and to our students the problem of energy, of a problem in which in society, we have a permanent presence of energy as there is a permanent presence of power. And both of them are interconnected. It is true, as Wilde said, or as Morris said, we can have general measurements of the energy produced or the energy consumed globally. But we should start using a system of energy income per capita, which is the energy that each individual consumes. So, if we could implement that possibility, we would realize what energy poverty is. Because if we only if we if we don't have the concept of energy income, we cannot have about energy poverty. Economic poverty is when people don't have enough money or products produced by money. So energy poverty is a situation in which people cannot have the amount of energy they need to survive. So we could say that there is some sort of real classification of energy poverty. So what is energy empowerment? Well, it's similar to a economic empowerment or freedom empowerment, meaning that we need to ensure that everyone has a basic energy income, a, a basic, in the same way we have a basic economic income, we would have a basic energy income because we need to realize that energy consumption is a real component that should be protected by a right so the right to energy is like the right to information. Of course, I, I need to have access to information, right? Well, the same thing would be with energy. So if we could really have these concepts clear, then it would be easier to talk about energy poverty, energy empowerment, and energy income. Okay, talking about energy poverty, according to the latest data, it is said that 9.3% of Europeans cannot maintain their homes hot, warm or cold in the summer and the winter because due to the high price of energy and the high price of living, 9.3% of the Europeans, meaning one out of 10 Europeans, compared to 6.9 in 2021. So it means that energy poverty in euros is worse, right? So how can we assess this from the social point of view? How does this affect people? And what uh, relationship does this have with the development? I mean, what we need to do is in the same way that we have a breakdown of different things that are necessary for life, like we have. We need um, ha housing. Do we need 500 square meters? No. We need basic housing with a minimum service. So we need to get used to be able to measure things. Firstly, to be able to calculate and distribute them. Otherwise, 
we are using vague concepts or that can cause indignation and can cause other reactions but don't bring solutions. I've just written a book called Universal History of Solutions. Yeah, we need solutions. Intelligence creates solutions because problems are raised by reality, by society, by biological needs. So problems come by themselves. And we need to create solutions. We can't be around the bush. So do we know any solutions? Let's keep on looking for solutions. The problem in Europe with the energy market, it's shameful. It really is. I mean, I'm ashamed. The things, the, the fact that the electricity costs differently every day, the change in legislation in Spain due to the production of renewable energies, this is shameful. So we need a solution. Many of the problems we have have solutions, but we need the political will and the social will to solve them. So I think a meeting like this should be used to say to the citizens, these issues have a solution. And do we want them to be solved or not? Because it's not that clear, you see. The same thing happens with education. Everybody complains about education. So we need a solution. We need to request a solution. The issue of education. Instead of complaining so much, and then when there is a survey asking citizens what their main concerns are, nobody says education is a main concern. So politicians will never find a solution because people don't complain about it. If people would state that the Spanish people are concerned by education, then it would be solved by the politicians. So if they talked about the having a concern, which is energy consumption and energy income, politicians will solve it. Otherwise, things get diluted in just mere moaning and complaining. And a complaint is inefficient. Otherwise, they will not bring about a solution. So we need to ensure an ener basic energy income. This is a proposal that no political party has made. We need a basic energy income. And, uh, and that is important for me. Thank you very much. We need a complaint and a proposal to solve it. You know. Yeah. We don't want complaints without a proposal. It's a, it's a logo that rhymes in Spanish. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, just to, to pick up or to react very quickly, I mean, on what, um, what has been said. I mean, indeed, energy... Oh. I mean, it's, it's, it's very true what you said in the, from the perspective of not looking at energy poverty without also taking into consideration all of the other social uh, and societal uh, um, impacts and effects that this has. Uh, um, one, you know, I find incredibly concerning statistic is that there is 95.3 million people in Europe, mm -hmm. one of the richest regions in the world, who are living in poverty or at risk of poverty. I mean, this is something, uh, I mean, this, which is, we talk about outrage, we talk about uh, being sh ashamed of, of, of things, this is one. I mean, 60 million of people at risk of energy poverty. So 60 million not being able, like we said, to cool their houses during the summer, heat their houses during the winter. Uh, and of them, 33 million are actually living in energy poverty. So, I mean, these are uh, undeniable uh, statistics. Uh, another statistic is uh, uh, the fact that over the last 25 years, uh, there has been a concerted uh, decrease in investment in social protection systems in Europe. I mean, I come from a country, Ireland, where we had a terrible economic uh, uh, crisis. Spain, I know, a year, no stranger to this as well. The first thing that was reduced in terms of national budget expenditure mm -hmm. was social provision for vulnerable populations. 
-hmm. So again, coming back to the idea of, uh, of uh, addressing uh, uh, power imbalance in society, more broadly speaking, it's understood that vulnerable communities aren't the ones that necessarily vote, therefore they're the ones that can be impacted mostly when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, reducing social budgets. So this is a, an, important, uh, an important thing. Energy poverty, uh, from what we've seen and from what um, other um, national Red Cross societies have been reporting to, to us, um, has really had an impact in, in three key areas. Um, so the first one is in the area of food. People having money or families of being able to uh, um, um, pay uh, their energy bills, but at the same time uh, have uh, food to put on the table for their family. I mean, again, remember we're talking about Europe, we're talking about European mm -hmm. member states with the most sophisticated social protection mm -hmm. systems uh, supposedly in the world. I mean, we, we still have a, an issue uh, here. Where we saw in the last year there was an increase of 15% in the cost of living, for most people, 15%, okay, it's tough, but we can manage it. 15% for a family on the breadline means that someone in that family goes with a meal, mm -hmm. or it means that indeed, um, that indeed uh, 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 electricity or gas I mean, is, is used more stringently within the, within the household. So this has a, a big impact when we talk about child nutrition. It has a big impact uh, when we talk about, uh, in the terms of education, a child going to school, you know, and being able to concentrate on what's being uh, delivered by a teacher in terms of the lessons and stuff along those lines. So it's, it's not small, and this is intergenerational, obviously. Mm -hmm. The second area, which we, we heard a lot from national societies, is in the area of health. Mm -hmm. So people who generally uh, live in, let's call, them, call it um, um, energy inefficient housing, also tends to work uh, low uh, skilled labour and also tend as well to be at higher risk of uh, health. So what, in, that, in that context we can say that the, the, the causes of uh, energy poverty and health are both mutually reinforcing in that context. So one in a sense uh, impacts uh, on, the, on, the, on the other. Um, you know, uh, Another, another aspect in terms of health, I mean, and something, again, that is very much, uh, I think, uh, related to the experience of a lot of uh, uh, vulnerable families in particular was the mental health issue in around being able to, to pay their bills. Mm. So, I mean, again, looking at this, if we consider, and this is the third one, if we consider that the vast majority of people in Europe are living in rental accommodation, mm. not being able to pay your electricity or gas bill could possibly result in eviction. Yeah. And we know that, uh, and there was a very uh, good study uh, undertaken by the French organization, uh, the Fondation d'Abbé Pierre, who stated that if you have uh, experienced eviction once in your life, you are at a higher percentage, I think it was like 50 or 60 percent, of experiences again in your life. So again, looking at the intergenerational impact of mm -hmm. this, where you have a child who experiences eviction as a child, that the chances are later on in their life, they will experience it again or themselves will be evicted from uh, a rental accommodation. So this is, this is huge. The last point that I want to draw on, I think, uh, which, is, which has um, really impacted, I would say, on the work of not-for-profit organizations like Red Cross, uh, has been the financial impact uh, of operating community-based uh, outreach services for the most vulnerable uh, while operating uh, uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a level whereby uh, um, you know, we've had uh, and we've seen spiraling costs in terms of, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of um, 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 energy consumption or energy, uh, energy bills, excuse me. And having to meet that on the one side to keep our doors open and to continue to provide the service. I mean, this is not something that's overtly recognized, mm -hmm. I would say, by, uh, by governments at the regional or the local levels. And I am of the most definitely of the opinion that if not-for-profit organizations were to close their doors in the morning, mm. the social problems in Europe uh, would, uh, would escalate you know, beyond manageable, um, manageable um, um, actions coming from, uh, coming from governments. So these are the big, mm. uh, I would say, the big, social, uh, the big social issues that we see uh, as regards the, the, the energy poverty mm -hmm. uh, issue in Europe over the last couple of years. And we saw that in the panel earlier, that it is all interrelated. And what Ronald said is that there is, in a way, a global way of considering poverty. And poverty has sensitive points. Uh, one is food. Then I think education, because education is also 
produces poverty and consolidates poverty, meaning that people with low education will be installed in poverty. Another point is housing, and another point has to do with health, undoubtedly, because the situation of poverty coming through different ways, like not having sufficient food, sufficient education, or having lifestyles or en environments that do not have hygiene or health, this all leads to poverty. He has mentioned something that is very important because in the past, people didn't say that mental health has to do with poverty-related stress, because he's right. Poverty causes pressure on stability, which leads to severe problems. And lastly, the specific consumption of energy that is not food, to a certain extent, has to do with factors that are not essential for life, but essential for comfort, for well-being. Like I was a kid of the Spanish Civil War, and I was raised in an energy poverty environment because houses at the time had no air conditioning nor heating. So we would just survive with one stove in one room for the whole house. So if you had the stove, then you were out of energy poverty. But now we don't do it like that. We have different standards. Now we have higher living standards. So what we see now is that we now demand and request a minimum level of comfort in their home due to a mere reason of comparison, meaning standards of living is rising, so we need, we have more rights that we can request to be fulfilled. But when we analyze the severity of levels for poverty, if we analyze or classify this severity in, in social policies, we will know better what our priorities are. So in Spain nowadays, priority of housing is very important. It's a severe problem because people, there are people with a roof. If they don't have a place to live, they don't have a chance to access energy because energy is given to us through their our dwelling. So we are in a defenseless situation. And I can see that we are becoming used. In developed countries, we are becoming used to the situation of inequality, meaning that it is not that we are less human, it's that we are more individual. So we have become more individualistic, and we have realized that problems don't have to do with us. They don't involve us, so they are not our responsibility. So it's not our job to look after other persons problems, let, let the state take care of that. Well, the problem of NGOs is that NGOs trying to solve problems to the best of their knowledge. And I think NGOs have lost something, which I think that in the turn of the century, we questioned the role of the NGOs, right? So one of the functions was to help in situations where the individual initiatives or the state initiatives wouldn't work, and to develop a pedagogical role of awareness raising of the civil society. And at the time, I insisted on bringing the NGO world to the education world and that we should organize NGOs with the participation of really young people in them. And it is being done, but I think, in a way, we have lost interest in being pedagogical of volunteership, for example, because 
On the one hand, there is some sort of skepticism regarding the role of NGOs. Uh, Salome, you know that in Spain there was a strong campaign against NGOs in Spain from different sides. They were against NGOs because they said that they were sort of like solving the problems of the state uh, and being the servants of the state. And uh, they were done by the NGOs. On the other hand, th that they were full of good will, but still they would consolidate the, pro the problem. So I think we need a, a lot of pedagogical work to raise awareness on the civil social responsibility and participation in solving social problems. The education world will not do it. And I think NGOs should recover their role of pedagogical awareness raising voices, which they had in the past and which in Spain, I think they have lost that function. So we need to go back. So I correlate this with something that probably when we say it to people who are listening to us, they may find it irritating, which is the fact that they, it's a big social and educational disaster to see that we have removed prestige from the feeling of compassion. Compassion is such a human feeling is the only feeling that when you lose compassion, you, t you tell them you are not humane. So before arriving to justice, and when we say we don't want compassion, we want justice. Well, compassion comes first and then justice. Compassion opens up the way and then the justice comes. So when I'm seeing somebody dro drowning in the sea, I'm not going to think whether it's just that I saved them. They are about to drown. So I save them. Compassion goes first. So in the schools, compassion is a feeling that comes in children when they are 28 months old, compassion disappears as the education system progresses. And this is really serious because if we don't give human beings that emotional feeling, that human feeling, we are removing an, obst uh, an obstacle to aggressiveness and one of the driving forces for cooperation and help. So if we say now that we need a compassion pedagogy or compassion education, but compassion is not being patronizing. Compassion is that I am feeling the pain of the other, and therefore I need to stimulate my compassion because it is my compassion that will open the door so that I can help others, so that I can participate in the social well-being, I can participate in defending the rights of the others. So therefore, there is a clear deficit of compassion. So I'm asking the NGOs for help. I'm talking to the Red Cross right now. To come close to the education world, to strengthen participation of citizens. Estoy totalmente de acuerdo la idea de la compasión, la idea de que la gente tiene que entender que no vivimos en distintos compartimentos aislados, para nada. You have to bear in mind that in the Anglo-Saxon world, compassion has a positive meaning. In the U.S., for example, the, you you ask a politician to be compassionate. In Spain, no. In Spain, it has rather a negative uh, aspect because to feel compassion is to feel pity and more than empathy. So that is why I tell you because in the Anglo-Saxon world, it has to be compassionate, to be, feel compassion. It has a totally different feeling and it's a very positive feeling. And in Spain, the word has lost that meaning. Which is a pity uh, to say, but I, I, and if I can maybe propose a very tangible solution, because you mentioned the importance of volunteering, for example. Uh, why not, you know, look at supporting, but really supporting more and more young people, but anyone in general, um, to, to undertake uh, volunteering in order to 
recoup or regain some of this compassion, mm -hmm. some of this understanding, some of this empathy that we're talking about, particularly with uh, vulnerable groups or communities, I mean, I think could, uh, could work. In the EU now, they talk about that, this big framework called the economy of well-being. And sitting in the, this economy of well-being is that the, the, the idea of uh, volunteering. Because what they found is that at, you know, 60s, or should I say, sorry, uh, 67, 68, when people are retiring, once they retire, they don't know what to do with their life and their well-being drops through the floor. What do I do? I have no meaning, I have no job, uh, blah, 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 blah. And one of the things they're trying to do more and more is to get these groups, uh, predominantly, yes, of course, older people, but I mean, to get them nonetheless to volunteer more in their communities and to, to engage more in their communities. But the thing is, because they've been so individualistic, should I say, uh, in their outlook, uh, very focused on work, they themselves are kind of removed from their community. So a lot of work has to be done in that context as well to create those bridges to, to allow for volunteering. But the education system, lifelong learning, we talk about this very, very often, I think is a fantastic, uh, is a fantastic uh, uh, in this context maybe, tool uh, to, to support something or an action that's quite tangible, quite achievable, like volunteering. And this is... Uh, you mentioned something that I think it is very important. I've been very much involved in education for many, many years, and we tried to copy in Spain something that it works very well in the U.S., that is to learn and after to render a service, that is that students within the educational system, one part of their training has to be provided to granting a special public service, public behavior, doing something for somebody else, and it was part of the curriculum. And I tried to explain all the parents and all the authorities at that level that I had, I could reach to, that to dedicate certain hours uh, to learn to provide service to others, not only it was not hampering the development of your studies, but on the contrary, it fostered your studies. That is that we are favoring in our students to create some responsibility for others, and that creates more responsibility for yourself. And that's from the empathy viewpoint, it's something very, very positive. But we didn't manage anything. We didn't manage to convey this message. And it's a pity. And with this sort of event, I think that is an idea that has to be relaunched to send this message to society. Because when we are speaking about these issues, these topics, is to increase the amount of collective intelligence. The fact that we are being reflected, the general situation is reflected upon our situation and to go a little bit closer to volunteering in order to explain why the social problems that can be affecting ourselves, why it requires the intelligence, the motivation of all these in order to try to solve them. When unfortunately, this conversation has turned to a totally different view. Uh, but from energy poverty, there was something that Carlo Martingaita said. I'm very, very surprised that I speak about something totally different and I fly around in branches, but perhaps it's much better to be out there to f be able to focus in something. But in, we mentioned this empowerment, and we mentioned this uh, energy poverty. We have to close this dialogue and this conversation, coming back again to this uh, um, energy poverty and coming back to um, including values. Do you really think that the empowerment of consumers, these uh, energy independence, would lead us to go forward in other freedoms? 
Well, it's, it's, I don't know if it's exactly what, uh, uh, it's a different vision. That's what Jose Antonio, he was saying in the very beginning, the fact that you consume more energy, it implies that is higher cultures and more developed societies. Is that struggling with the decarbonization that we are uh, fighting for? Or perhaps is this a totally different topic that we don't have any time? No, no, the question, I did understand it, and I think that the question is very, uh, very uh, precise, but it takes me backwards. When we mention, let us start that we are starting from uh, misled information. If we have to separate civil society from political society. Civil society, we are here, and politics, and the political society is the one that has the power. But the different thing is whether you are governing or not, but we are all political society. So we all need to have an aware of what is our political authority. So we don't have to see it as that we are going to suffer from what the politicians are doing. No, we have to be aware of our action, our capability of influencing in the um, leaders, in the political leaders. So that is why in every political system, it's a respect of the politicians to the citizens and the other way around. So then in this process, we have to acknowledge what is the capacity and the authority of the ones we govern on. So we have to increase their ability of acting. When you reach freedom for those that you govern is limiting the power of those that create the policies to all those that receive the strategical um, policies. But when we refer to poverty is that it limits it limits and eliminates responsibilities. So this means that when we increase the resources of a human being, is its possibility of reacting, and therefore we are increasing its freedom. Whenever we enlarge the use of freedom, we are enlarging the democracy and we are improving, and in, in other words, to avoid poverty means reaching freedom. So it's a complicated thing. So Ronald, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, it's very complicated. Um, <laughs> and, it's, 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 and the question I think is very good. And, and in truth, we could have a session just on that question, perhaps. I mean, I, I mean, maybe just to come back, I think maybe some of the themes, I mean, that have been somewhat reoccurring in the conversation that we've had today, so, I mean, is, is one that springs to mind again for me when we talk about energy poverty is the issue of uh, equality or rather inequality. Mm -hmm. And yes, a lot of progress has been made to at least mitigate, you know, for energy poverty uh, uh, in Europe, but I think uh, in order to have a better or broader understanding, we need to to collect more information, to have more indicators, I mean, on, you know, key aspects or, 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 or looking at key demographic groups uh, like gender, like ethnic minorities, uh, looking at other areas like digital inclusion, like transport, for example, to raise awareness amongst decision makers that um, energy poverty is also a question of energy injustice. So, you know, so yes, we could have, uh, you know, uh, more, uh, more um, uh, sovereignty, more energy independence, uh, yes, that's fine. But, you know, how and that's uh, uh, open and accessible for everybody, there's a question mark over. Uh, is it affordable? There's a question mark over. Um, does it uh, take into consideration exacting needs of specific vulnerable groups? For, people, for example, people with uh, disabilities, uh, there's a question mark uh, over this as well. So I think if we 
you know, again, coming back to the idea of addressing power imbalances, I mean, if we adequately address power imbalances through inclusive consultation, through the development of inclusive and, importantly, implementation of inclusive strategies, then yes, for sure, uh, we can, I think, have a, a society which is a more inclusive and uh, where everybody is able to access uh, um, uh, energy at affordable, uh, at affordable um, levels, but also as well to ensure that their, their needs or specific needs are also, are also met. But there's a lot of work to be done in that context because the, uh, the other risk is that, you know, you know, how do we achieve it? You know, what's in place to support in the context, let's say, of the EU member states to, to achieve, uh, um, again, um, um, energy, uh, energy independence for, for, for all. And that can't come at, at any cost. I mean, that requires that uh, energy resource from now on, because of the risks there are with, uh, with uh, carbon emissions and the environmental catastrophe we're facing, um, or the next generation most definitely will face, uh, also needs to be mitigated for through the solutions we identify which allows us to be more independent. And in that context, you know, we, 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 we can't think in, in, in silos anymore and everything most definitely is, uh, is connected in, in, in that sense. So I think working together as the EU wants us uh, to work together, I think the EU has an ambitious plan in the EU Green Deal and this uh, Fit for 55 legislation which looks to... Uh, um, um, reduced by 55% to carbon emissions by the end of the decade. Mm -hmm. Super ambitious, well done. Um, you know, and they have uh, different plans as well put in place to support member states in doing that. But again, implementation, 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 using a rights-based perspective, inclusive consultation, and ensuring that these strategies uh, uh, really do meet the needs of all, not just a few, uh, is, uh, is key. So I think... Uh, as you see, we can continue because 45 minutes, of course, it's not enough. But unfortunately, we have to stop the debate uh, because we've reached the end of our session. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time, although we would love to continue. Thank you very much, Ronald, for your participation here and your contributions. Well, thank you very much, Jose Antonio, and thank you very much, Ronald. It was a great pleasure to listening to both of you. It has been really wonderful to have uh, both of you here and thank all the previous uh, speakers for living your arguments and to try to lead us to action. The Red Cross and the Foundation uh, for more than 200 years of background. And in order to close this session, we are going to give the floor the president of Maria del Mar Pajeo, the president of the Red Cross Foundation in Madrid. Hello, good afternoon to everybody, Secretary of State, representatives of the Academia of Civil Society, private institutions, public institutions, the patronage, the trust, trustees, my dear friends of the International Federation of uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, I would like to acknowledge that it is a great privilege that such an event is celebrated here today in the headquarters of the Spanish Red Cross. I just arrived, unfortunately, for problems on the agenda. I couldn't attend from the very beginning. I've checked whether this was recorded and in streaming, and I will listen to the session later on. They've already told me what was the topic treated here, and I'm super convinced that it was super interesting topics. And it was a cycle organized by the um, 
Foundation, which is dedicated to climate change. I think this is very important, not only in the reality, it is impossible to see how it does it work, and more it is to calculate that climate change when accepting the different, uh, the different topics as uh, jobs, bad uh, poverty, loss of health, uh, the Charter for Climate for Change for Humanitarian Organizations within the Red Cross Federation with the support of the advisory uh, body, it starts with the following sentence. The, crisis, the climate changes and environmental crisis become a threat to humanity. All the different aspects of our life are affected from our mental health to food safety, hydric safety, and economic. If the crisis affects all citizens, the ones that have less contributed to the problem are the worsened. And the situation goes worse and worse. So the reality, it's not uniform. It affects all the marginal communities and all the communities that have less resources to adapt. The World Report against heat and tide uh, represented all the risks of the climate change, not only amongst the countries, but as well between the different collectives within the regions. This document explains how the poor people and the most exposed to high risk would be the most affected by climate crisis. As far as the fatality rate, the death rate, the economic problems and crises. And this report at the same time alerted us that nevertheless there will no be any country that will not be affected by climate change. In, within our foundation, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent societies, we've been involved and we have created for over 20 years the Climate Center. This center was born in supporting all the members and partners that all these extreme events might have upon the more vulnerable populations. So this was one of the priorities of our agenda and of our future agenda. As the president of the foundation this morning said, the 2030 agenda that recalls the objectives of the 191 societies of our foundation require our future steps for the next years. The crisis in relation with climate change and with environmental crisis are one of the five important challenges prioritized for the next 10 years. And we have therefore to focus on the attention of reducing its consequences now and in the future and supporting the citizens in overcoming such a difficult situations. So according to this strategy, the Red Cross for 2023-2026 includes fighting against climate change, and this is through specific commitments, through the different areas of our strategy that would allow us to work in the different regions through different initiatives. And I will give you certain examples of what we are doing already in the Red Cross, including environmental sustainability, continuing with the 
forestation and reforestation benefit the environment, improving the ability of citizens to respond to this crisis, supporting vulnerable families, overcoming energy poverty in specific economic crisis, environmental crisis, and climate crisis, to making population awareness of this ecological and environmental crisis and showing what are the consequences of these risks in the environment in order to providing the specific tools to overcome these situations. And here, the foundation of the Spanish Red Cross would play a very important role. The importance lies on the following. On the one hand, that the problems dealt with are very difficult problems. They have multidimensional um, problems or size, and it requires a vertical and transversal strategy integrating the participation of academia, science, and the different communities. So that's why all these conversations, humanitarian conversations, are of utmost importance. And therefore, we have to focus on this idea to do it in a listening environment, empathy environment, and to discover collaboration opportunities to face this humanitarian danger. We have to increase the full commitment that would imply our participation with the different abilities that we have. And we have to generate that effort in order not to leave anybody apart. Those are the risks that we are running. It is very important to celebrate these events because of their contributions. And today, I think that we have mentioned important conclusions that would allow us to continue going forward. So therefore, I would like to thank our speakers, Jose Mario Rodrigo Rodriguez, Raquel Fernández, Raquel Fernández de Guija, Gonzalo Sánchez Ferran, Ronald Nagan, and Jose Antonio Marina, as well the president of the Red Cross Foundation, the different board of trustees for the new participation of the foundation. And I would like to thank IAC for facilitating this collaboration and the environmental teams of the Red Cross for having organized this event. To organize uh, this event, it's not an easy task. So that is why I would like to thank all of those that have participated in the organization and in the celebration that have and the people that are here present and as well those of of you that are following us on the streaming channel. I would like to thank the Secretary of State for being here in the closing of the session. And before giving him the floor to close this event, I would like to close this event with a reflection of the chapter of climate and environmental issues. As humanitarian organizations and local organizations at a local, national, and international level, we are very much concerned about the magnitude of the crisis and how to be able to respond to these problems. We are decided to act. We have the responsibility of acting together, reducing the consequences, and forcing a general mobilization for everybody to participate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. The president of the Red Cross has said it is an honor for us to have the secretary 
uh, of state, on environmental, all the demographic, uh, environmental ministry for ecological transition and demographic uh, challenge. Mr. Hugo Moran. Well, thank you very much. Good morning or early afternoon, rather. We started in the morning with the inauguration uh, of uh, environmental journalists on an event that they were saying that water is important. And now I close uh, my morning, or I finish my morning, closing this event here in the Red Cross exactly with the same topic, a very similar topic. It means that there is a huge concern on behalf of the citizens how important environmental issues are. It is a pleasure to be with you in this event organized by the Spanish Red Cross and to close this event that is to reach to the citizen the problems of uh, climate change. I feel at home because I've been a member of the Red Cross for many, many years already. And I think this is a very good background to start asserting something that already belongs to the what Un United Nations has said for many years. It is impossible to think of guaranteeing health for citizens if previously we cannot guarantee an, an environmental quality, health quality. And I would like to mention something that we have read in the media lately on the 10th of November, the signature between an agreement between Australia and Tuvalu. Australia would receive climate refugees from the archipelago between Australia and Hawaii, which is on its way of disappearance because of the rising level of the sea. Two of the most important atolons have already disappeared, and the predictions is that in 2030, it will totally disappear. So this is one example of the horrible consequences of climate change that are not part of the future, but they've become already a, a reality today. This suffering caused in many communities, and especially in the most vulnerable communities. The increase of heat, of temperatures, creating drought, floodness, floods, the increase of the sea level, and this is risking not only the stability of ecosystems, but as well the food chain, the access to water, it, it provokes uh, the loss of many land. The example of Tumalo, it's not a single example, but there are millions of displaced caused by climate change. And all these natural uh, disasters have caused uh, many, many disasters in 2022, a figure quite higher than the number of casualties of war uh, conflicts. Uh, at the same time that we heard about this news, the Copernicus uh, system, satellite system, confirmed that we have lived the hottest period in our planet. In Copernicus, they assert that 2023 would be the highest temperature year since we have been able to measure the temperature. We have Climate Central as well studying this uh, data that during the last 12 months has been the highest in temperature in the last 20 years. And according to worldwide contribution, has uh, provided the uh, climate change and the El Nino cyclic change, and as well uh, um, the greenhouse effect. 
and it, they contribute 29% of humanity are exposed to a heat which is above the average. 5,305 billion, 5.3 billion were above the average temperature, and amongst it, half of the Spanish population. And the provisions are not very be better, but we have to do something because otherwise we will address a climate crisis without precedence. It is true that climate change is a global reality, but it is quite true as well that it's not exactly the same everywhere. So that is why collaboration and cooperation is of utmost importance in order to reach those economies with less opportunities. We need to create these spaces, dialogue spaces, to overcome the gaps between countries and with a common action. And he says the sixth report published by the IPCC of the United Nations underline the uh, link between um, economic crisis and uh, climate poverty. And this is something that has to be addressed by all governments, implying civil societies or communities, scientific institutions, mass media, and investors. We have to work for a multi-level governance, inclusive governance that would include all the different sectors of society, basing ourselves on the scientific knowledge that we have and acting in a more aware and uh, a, um, implicit manner. So in this line, European policies, the world uh, agenda is being one of the priorities because the climate change cannot be considered as an isolated matter. So this is why innovation, employment, and the improving the different tools for improving food safety. Spain is very much involved in this agenda, and the climate change strategy and policy has become one of the most important policies at a national level in Spain. And as the government already stated in January 2020, this environmental strategy and climate change politics has to be implanted within the strategy of the countries without trying to simply establish biodiversity much better management of water, circular economy, and to be aware that the eco it's, uh, healthy ecosystems are the base of health and well-being for the citizens. And this would enable us to adapt to climate change and to assure our energy accessibility as uh, food resources. So therefore, we have established a uh, framework that would guarantee the UNC and the Paris Agreement in order to establish uh, the uh, climate uh, change on the, C uh, the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the stra national strategy against energy poverty, the decarbonization strategy for 2050, the new adapting plan, the strategy of a fair transition, the strategic plan of health and environmental issues, and as well, uh, climate change and sustainability. In an international context, our country is implied in defending and supporting climate change because this would prioritize our agenda, perhaps with the gaps that we are observing. On the 30th of November in, in Dubai, we will have the UN uh, COP28 that uh, will become an 
final effort to see the new approach and a global response to climate change. It is very important the international community will agree in the need to lead these efforts in reducing emissions where the big stakeholders have to be the leaders and as well to be able to face the impacts. We have to assure our action so as to react in a shorter period. We are very much aware that this contribution is going to be a difficult uh, strategy in order to uh, maintain the limit of 1.5 degrees accorded in Paris in 2015. In an era without fuel fossils, to uh, multiply by three the ratio of the greenhouse effect and to implement the fund of helping those countries that needed it most. So this debate is going to be the core of our debate and it's going to be one of the basic ideas in facilitating absurdities in other departments. So therefore, I think that it is very important that all together in COP28 will send signals for the reduction of uh, emissions. The decrease of these emissions has to be the process that would accelerate this change. The European Union would be present in debate in Dubai with the priority of establishing these uh, commitments. And we are going to play an important role as holding the presidency of the European community. We are in a very important moment in which the diagnosis is a very clear diagnosis. We have to act now, although we have to rethink about the international structure in order to improve uh, fairness at an international level, to implement trust in our nations, and to make a good, scalable sustainability. Our future is very much interconnected with sustainability, and we shouldn't go back in development. The commitment that Spain has, it's an important one, but we need more than never to join efforts. So I think that these events organized by the Spanish Red Cross would help us in our duty, in our task, which is to accelerate this uh, ecological transition. So I wish you all the best. We should continue on the same path because it's the correct path. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary of State, dear President. I wish all inequalities that we have discussed in these three round tables today can be solved and those gaps can be bridged. So three take home messages. Number one, if we don't claim and fight for our dreams, we will stay in the trenches. We don't want to do that because we don't want a clear campaign without a proposal. Another idea, sustainability is living better. And lastly, the future is not written. So if we go back to how we started this morning when we talked about Albert Camus, I am going to close with another quote which says, generosity for the future means doing your best today in the present. So thank you to those of you who are present here today and online for your generosity, for your courage. Let's generate more humanitarian conversations from compassion. And I wish you a happy future. Thank you very much.
Thank you.